Okay. Well, John Henry Simler built the first house in Phillipsburg in the early 1800s. And though the historical society looked and looked for me, this was the earliest photograph that they could find. In 1820, Phillipsburg's population had grown to 57 residents. And together, the community gathered together and built a different kind of house. They built a meeting house. They built it out of logs, and that was used as the, the community's first school and the community's first church. Now, it wasn't just the first church for Phillipsburg. It was the first church in all of the Mashannon Valley. The Historical Society tells me that there are no photographs of that original church building. But that church was open for use by all Protestant ministers. In 1842, the building was renovated to what we now know as Union Church. A mixture of plaster and clay stucco were used to cover the outside of the church, giving it the nickname... The Old Mud Church, yes. Each of the Protestant churches in town met there for weekly worship until they were each able to afford to purchase land and build their own buildings. It was this church, though, the group of free Methodists in this community that last used Union Church for its weekly worship services. And that was in the early 1920s. For almost 200 years, people have been gathering in Phillipsburg to worship God. And it all began in one meeting house. People of different denominations all came together and shared common space. And that space was used by people that had one common purpose. There was a mission to bring about God's kingdom on earth. In that shared space, the faithful people of God devoted themselves to studying the word of God, to prayer, to working and playing together, and to sharing meals together. Now that's a pretty good description of the early days of Christian community in Phillipsburg. But really, it's even more than that. It's also a perfect description of of the birth of the Christian church. Long before there were any denominations, long before it was regularly thought of to have church buildings. And we're going to look at the beginning of the Christian church today in Acts chapter 2. So whether you use your hard copy of the Bible or electronic copy, would you please open to Acts chapter 2. And if you're using the Pew Bible, we'll be on page 734. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to begin in verse 42. So please listen and receive this word from God this morning. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That is a perfect description of what Christian church is supposed to be, a community of contributors. Not a Christian church, but the Christian church. You see, when we use a small c for church, That describes a building. But when we use a capital C, that describes the body of Christ, his church, 
The people are what make up the Christian church. And for many, many years, centuries, there were no denominations. It wasn't until the fourth century when denominations began to form. So for almost 300 years, there was only one church, capital C, the Christian church. While denominations are a reality for us today, there really is only one church made up of people that are devoted to following Jesus. That is why every week I thank you for bringing the church into this room. Because until the church arrives, it's just a room. Wherever the people of God gather in his name is the church. So if you hold a Bible study in your home, there's the church. If you meet in a coffee shop around the Bible and you're talking about things that have to do with church, there's the church. It's just a room until you bring the church in here. So it doesn't matter where we gather. Wherever we gather, we are the church. The passage that we just read in Acts is considered to be the blueprint for how followers of Jesus, his church, are supposed to operate and function. And that passage is a picture of authentic Christian community. But I think 21st century Christians need to follow the spirit of the blueprint more than the letter of the blueprint. For instance, sharing possessions and sharing meals were very important and very doable in the early church. But I don't think we are mandated to sell our property and possessions and give to others that are in need. So I'm not going to ask you to put all your jewels in here so that we can build our new church. That's not going to happen. That would be following the letter or the letter of the law rather than the spirit of, of the blueprint. I don't think it's necessary for all of us to share every meal together every day either. That's following the letter of the blueprint, not the spirit of the blueprint. So the Free Methodist Church has given us some instruction for how we are to use our possessions or how we are to think about our possessions. And these instructions are born right out of the scriptures. So I'm going to read to you from what we call our book of discipline as it talks about the stewardship of our possessions. Here's what it says. Although as Christians we accumulate goods, we should not make possessions or wealth the goal of our lives. Rather, as stewards, we give generously to meet the needs of others and to support ministry. The scriptures allow the privilege of private ownership. Though we hold title to possessions under civil law, we regard all that we have as the property of God entrusted to us as his stewards. While customs and community standards change, there are changeless scriptural principles that govern us as Christians in our attitudes and our conduct. Whatever we buy, whatever we use, whatever we wear reflects our commitment to Christ and our witness in the world. We therefore avoid extravagance and we live in simplicity. So how do we reconcile that with Acts chapter 2, what we just read? I think there's one phrase in verse 42 that we read that can answer this question and define the church as a community of contributors. And it's right in the beginning of verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves. Continually devoting themselves. Devoting is a very compelling word. It means having great power, authority, or influence. The people that formed the early church allowed the Holy Spirit's power, authority, and influence to use them 
as partners with God to bring about God's kingdom on earth. They were fully devoted to God and to one another. And that is why the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. If we, the 21st century church, are going to be a community of contributors, we have to do as they did. We have to continually devote ourselves to one another and to God. And if we're truly committed to being partners with God, we should be interacting and partnering with other Christians that attend other churches. I would suggest and I would hope that everyone sitting in here knows at least one person that goes to a church other than G Free Church. If not, you need to get to town more often. You really need to expand your base. You see, for us to be a community of contributors, we have to become aware of what other local churches are doing. And one way to become aware is to talk to your friends and your family members that go to other churches. Ask them, what is your church doing that displays the glory of God to our community? Ask them, what is your church doing to tell people outside of your church how much God loves them? Here's another way. Join their Facebook pages. I join everybody's Facebook page, their church's Facebook page. I think everybody I know, I'm friends with their Facebook page of their church. It helps me to know what other churches are doing, especially in our own community. For example, when I first moved to this community, I became friends with the pastor of the Free, of the, yeah, the Free Methodist Church. I did become his friend. But <laughs> I think. I don't know. <laughs> but First Presbyterian Church down in town. And I learned through their Facebook page that they have a blue Christmas service. Now, I don't know if you know what that is. A blue Christmas service is for people that feel blue during the Christmas season. For many people, this season is not a happy season. And for some people, they avoid church during the month of December because it's a hard season for them. And they come into the church and everybody's singing and happy and they just don't feel it. And so they will stay away. Well, First Presbyterian Church wants to give them a place to go and feel sad and let it be okay for them to be sad. So a blue Christmas service is designed for people that are grieving or feeling blue during the season. It's for people that might have experienced the death of a loved one or maybe they've had a job loss. If anyone's ever been without a job during the Christmas season, it's not a fun time. I know my husband was out of work one time, and when you got a little kid watching all the commercials on TV, it is a hard season to get through. So maybe they've experienced a job loss. Maybe they're experiencing divorce. Maybe they've been through divorce, and this is the year that the kids go with the other parent. And that's hard. So First Presbyterian Church is giving these people a place to go and express their sadness. Now here at G Free, we don't offer a blue Christmas service. So what I do is I usually invite somebody that I know is going through a tough season during Christmas, and I ask them if they would like to go to the service with me. See, what First Presbyterian Church is doing is they're extending the love of God to people that are grieving, that are having an experience that is not the norm for Christmas. And so they're extending the love of God in a very unique way outside of the church and inside the church. So instead of us competing with them, why don't we just partner with them and bring people to that service? Now here's another example of being a community of contributors. This year in September, we decided to take part in See You at the Pole Day. So we gathered at various flagpoles around town for prayer 
at different times of the day. And we invited all the other churches in our community to participate. Now, some of those churches did come, and they brought members of their church with them. Some of their pastors came. And so we gathered together as the body of Christ around these flagpoles, and we prayed for our communities, for our schools, for our people, for our government officials, for our world, and for our community in general. But we came together as the body of Christ to do it. And when we partner with other churches in this way, we become a community of contributors. And that's how we bring about God's kingdom on earth right here in our community. You see, if we're all one church, every local church has a part to play in kingdom work. We don't have to compete with each other. Some churches are just going to do some things better than other churches. And so instead of competing, let's partner with them. And let's let people see us partnering and extend the love and the glory of God to this community. If every local church has a part to play in kingdom work, we should work together. And that is why Pastor Noel and I will, you may hear us say, don't you be inviting anybody that goes to another church to come here. There are literally thousands of people in our community not connected to the life of a church. We don't need to be going and taking people out of other churches. There are people that are disengaged from church, meaning they were engaged at one time, and for whatever reason, they no longer are. That's who we want to reach. There are people in our church that have never had an affiliation with any church. Those are the people we want to reach. And so we don't need to be inviting people that are already involved in the life of another church. Those are the people that we want to reach, the ones that are disengaged or unengaged. And as a community of contributors, we also need to celebrate when another church is growing, when another church is doing something that's really exposing the glory of God to the people in our community, when they're doing something that really is extending love to the people in our community, we need to celebrate with them and to partner with them. But in the same way, we need to grieve when we find out that another church is barely keeping their doors open. We don't celebrate. We should be grieving with them. That is what Paul meant when he wrote, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, especially at this time in our history, lots of exciting things are happening right now at G-Free. And it can be very easy for us to slip into thinking our church is really the only one that matters. But that's not true. Church is meant to be a community of contributors that all have one purpose in mind. Church is meant to be one body working toward that same purpose, to partner with God and to partner strong. That's what the sermon series is all about, partnering strong. And so today, I want to close this message with a prayer for all of us in this community, the church in this community. So as the praise team comes forward, I want to invite you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promise that wherever we are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of us. And so we stand on that today, knowing you are right here with us right now. Your word tells us that whatever we ask in accordance with your will, we can know that you are working behind the scenes to make that an answered prayer. And so we thank you in advance for all the ways that you're going to answer the prayers we now lift to you. Right now, we want to stand in the gap for all our partners in our community and in the surrounding communities, wherever we live, wherever we work, and wherever we play. 
Lord, we're asking that you would send a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to blow through every one of us so that these communities might feel something new. We pray that your church here, your people, will represent you well. And we pray that you would help us to have your ears and your eyes to see the people that we need to help and that we would truly serve the people in these communities. Your word tells us that we should come boldly to your throne of grace. So we do that right now when we boldly ask you to give us courage, to step out in acts of obedience, to step out and be willing to sacrifice our time, our talent, and our treasures with the people in these communities that need to know you. We pray that we would each have the courage to go and do and say whatever it is that you would have us go and do and say. We pray that you would give us peace to wait and to trust and to persevere. We pray that you would give us strength and vision to bring about all your plans for this community, for these communities. Let us see your heart and let us extend that heart to the people around us. Father, what I'm really asking is that we want you to build your kingdom right here in this community. So we pray all these things in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. And everybody here said, amen. Would you please stand? and sing with us.